it was actually my wife's idea. She, you know, she said, look, you know, let's, why don't we set up our own label? I'm like, nah, 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 <laughs> nah, 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 nah. <laughs> no, people do this and they, it fails, it doesn't work. And she's like, oh, we can try. I'm like, nah, no, no. <laughs> but she's pretty fearless with <laughs> this kind of stuff. It's the Blues Rock Show with Pete Francis. Welcome to the Blues Rock Show, I'm Pete Francis. Today, we've got a special guest joining us from the UK, one of the most talented blues rock guitarists out there today, Ainsley Lister. Ainsley, how are you? I'm good, thank you. I'm good. Thanks for the nice introduction. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> well, it's great to have you here in the U.S. I know it's a, it's a rare occasion for you to be yeah. here in the States. Yeah. Um, and it was great to see your set at Playing With Fire. You picked up the guitar at eight years old. Yeah. What was kind of the spark that got you going with guitar? It was my dad's record collection, really. Uh, my dad's he's always been a huge music fan um, in the sort of mid 60s with all the bands like, you know, Free, Fleetwood Mac, Cream, Hendrix. He, he was kind of there. You kind of went to see them and all that kind of thing. He's always been a, into a great guitar player. You know, he likes the guitar stuff and uh, he would just have the, uh, the record player on every night. It was his, his way of just chilling out and relaxing, really. And um, so I, I was kind of. I was born into that, you know, I kind of like, as, as soon as I was around, I didn't know any different. It was, there was always music around the house. And um, my dad did have a guitar, which I never actually saw him play it ever, but it was always around and I would just pick it up as a, as a kid, like four or five years old. And I would just, just, just it was like a toy. And um, one day I dropped it down the stairs and it broke in half and, uh, and my <laughs> what was your dad's reaction? Uh, he was, yeah, he was not too happy about it. Um, but it's, you know, I, don't, I says, you know, I really want a, another guitar. It, like, if you, can I have one for my birthday? And I promise I'll learn to actually learn to play the damn thing. <laughs> so for my eighth birthday, I got a guitar. And then I started um, at school. There was like a guitar club um, where you could join and, you know, you would sort of strum on a D chord and sing these songs where you, there was not much singing from our side but the, the teacher would sing along and we'd strum away on a d chord or an a chord and i found that didn't really work for me because it wasn't like the music that my dad had been playing on the record so i just went home and tried to work out what i was hearing and basically just picked it up by ear just you know learned to play by ear and it was mainly the lead guitar stuff um and this was on like a a three quarter size nylon strung classical guitar and I'm trying to play, you know, like Layla or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I, I got a, a, a good kind of basic grasp of it. Um, then I got an electric guitar, I think when I was 10. And, um, and that was it, I was off, you know, that, that was my hobby. All my friends were out playing football, riding bikes. I was at home playing my guitar. Yeah, when you were growing up playing guitar, <laughs> How many hours a day do you think on average you were putting in on guitar? I don't know. I guess at least two or three. But it was never, it was never, I was never told to do it. It wasn't like, right, you're learning guitar, you need to practice, you need to do your homework. It was never like that. It was um, just something I was just completely absorbed in. Like the world would just, you know, move to one side and I would just, just have this thing where I, Puts of records on my my dad basically gave me his old record player when he upgraded his his own. <laughs> um, it ended up in my bedroom and a, a box full of um, records, forty five size records. Uh, and I'd get home from school, do my homework, and then I'd put the record player on and sit with my guitar and just just play along. And yeah, a few hours a day, probably. Yeah. How have your practice habits changed over the years and? How often would you say you practice and play today, like on average? Do you know what? I don't think I've ever consciously practiced. I just play. I just play. It's just, it's something, I mean, even now, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 47 now. And my way of chilling out is to pick up a guitar. And I will just sit on the sofa. It's, it's very rare. I'll go through, through a day without picking up a guitar. I mean, 
in our house, there's a, there's a guitar, at least one guitar in every room of the house. There's Convenient. Guitar, there's guitars everywhere, you know? And um, yeah, it's just, I don't know, it, it's just something that I just connected with very, very early on. And it's, it's almost like- It's like a part of you. It's, yeah, it's a part of me. And, and so I've never consciously sat and thought, right, I need, to, I need to work on some scales, or I need to do this, or I need to do that. I just, I've always done it, so yeah. How old were you when you played your first gig? 13. Do you remember that experience? Yeah, I was terrified. <laughs> <laughs> I was absolutely terrified. As, but as long as I had a guitar in my hand, I was okay. I was like my comfort blanket. And um, I remember I was just this shy kid that kind of stood at the back, like with this black, black and white Strat copy. It was a, a Strat copy because I was into Clapton. Clapton was like my first like guitar hero, I, I suppose. And um, I just sort of stood at the back, like wouldn't look up, but I, I was playing. They plugged me into the PA, I think, which, you know, when I think about it now, must have sounded god awful, but I was happy. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of the, I, I was kind of asked to go along as a guest um, to just get uh, to sit in on uh, a couple of songs. And at the end of the night, the band, it was like a covers band, and uh, they asked me to join and says, you know, go and ask your mum and dad, you know, can you, can you come next week and the week after? And, uh, and that was kind of the start of my, my gigging career, yeah. So you started with covers. Yeah. When did you start writing original material? I started writing probably, I would write instrumental pieces pretty soon on. I think even before I did that first gig, I'd already written a couple of like, just, just come up with just pieces that I would play on a guitar. I started writing actual songs, you know, with lyrics. I didn't start singing until I was close on 20. And um, so, yeah, I probably started writing, singing and writing around about the same time, you know, sort of 19, 20, something like that. And the reason I started writing is because when I actually started my own band, when I was about 18, the covers that I would do, I was never quite happy with them. I would want to like change some lyrics or I'd want to change uh, a guitar part or change the key or add a section in. So I started like writing bits to go in the song. So I, it, it kind of worked for me more. And I thought, well, this is, this is a bit pointless. I might as well just write my own stuff, you know? So I, it kind of started, started that way really. People always talk about the guitar playing and guitar but you know you had to start singing at some point as well. Yeah. You know how much time and effort goes into singing and your vocals compared to guitar. So the vocal thing, I mean that came yeah, that came quite a bit later than the guitar and um I would go to jam I think when I was 15 or 16 my dad would take me to like blues jam sessions. And I would get up and I was I was the 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 young kid that played, you know, reasonably convincing blues guitar, but I didn't sing. And loads of people said, do you want to do this for a career? And I'm like, ah, oh, just, no. yeah, just, you know, the idea of actually doing this for a living as a career never really occurred to me, it was just a passion. And they said, well, you know, do you want to play in a band? Yeah, I do want to play in a band. And they said, well, if you don't sing, you're always going to be kind of a, a, a side guy. You know, do you want to call the shots? I'm like, yeah, I said, well, you need to sing. So I, you know, um, I tried singing and um, it's the first time I'd ever really sang. And so that took a bit of work because it was kind of, you know, I'd already developed the guitar. So singing, I had to like catch up. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the singing thing, I've, yeah, I've had to work on. Um, and, um, but in order to, yeah, if you're writing songs and you've got a story to tell, you know, you need to sing it yourself really because you're going to, if you've written a song that's, if it's about something that means something to you, you know, you're gonna probably convey it better than anyone really. So, uh, so yeah, that came a bit later, but I have, yeah, I've had to work at that a bit. <laughs> Does songwriting come easily for you? Yeah, and no, <laughs> because the songwriting thing is, I really love it, but I still, even now, all these years later, I still quite, can't quite figure out how I do it. It just happens, which sounds crazy, but like the, the inspiration and the ideas, 
they just you never know when they're going to come and when when you get those moments of the of clarity you have an idea um you've you've got to act on it there and then and it's it's always in the most inopportune time you know you'll be in the bath or something or you'll be like just going to bed and you get an idea you know like, okay right i'll make a cup of coffee and i'll i'll stay up and i'll i'll work on it now um but yeah um when i get the ideas for songwriting i try and act on it there and then and that that's the bit that can sometimes be you know you've got to be quite disciplined you you can't just think well i'll do that later cuz you when you get the ideas for songs like be it a lyric a melody a musical idea at the time you can see the whole landscape you can picture it but if you come back to it later you're in a different headspace so you have to act on it there and that's the bit that can be challenging sometimes you you just got to get on with it at the time yeah a lot of artists talk about when they get an idea they'll whip out their cell phone they'll record it or they've got a hard drive you know yeah. with tons and tons of ideas yeah how many ideas do you have i mean do you do the cell phone thing do you have oh, like a yeah, hard drive yeah 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 like? i i do i do and um <laughs> i you know you can't you know you're not always you know you might be on a bus or something or you know on a train and you can't you don't have a guitar with you so you right. can't act on it there and then so you know you'll be kind of like you like sort of you'd be like singing into your phone like really quiet and at the time you know exactly what you're talking about and and you know exactly what the idea is but you know you listen to it a, a few days later and you're like what on earth was that you can't even you know make out what it was so it's um but yeah i have the the, uh, the voice recorder on my phone and the note section is you know it's chock full of ideas and i have to go through it periodically and kind of write delete delete definitely delete uh, oh that's that, no nah, delete <laughs> you know oh there's something there and then you kind of go through it and you're like okay yeah i think there's there's an idea there and then you kind of work on it has technology do you think helped you as a songwriter because when you first started out you know there weren't cell phones probably or not as prevalent no uh, you know not no. not smartphones absolutely i and, have been going that and, long and, yeah. you know with computers and all <laughs> all of that stuff i think you know technology has to help in some way because now like you may have been able to have like a some sort of recorder back in the day but the fact yeah. now you could have hundreds and hundreds of ideas that you could save you know in a computer or or in a phone has to make it easier to go back to you know some ideas maybe you had an idea 3 or 4 years ago and you go back to it i think i think although the technology has changed i think the method is pretty much the same you know like back in the day you had like a cassette recorder right. a little dictaphone thing the same thing really it's just you know obviously now you've got you've got a phone that's got your entire life on it you know like everyone has and it's got all this stuff so you don't need to carry around a tape recorder or you know um I've normally got my, you know, my my laptop with me. So you've got all this stuff. I've got logic on my laptop. So if I get an idea musically and I think I need to do this now, you know, you open up, you know, your MacBook and you've got logic and you get the drums going and stuff. Back in the day, I uh, I had a drum machine and one of those like huge like hard disk recorders where it's got it's got a drum machine built in. It's got guitar effects. So essentially all you need is a pair of headphones and a cable to connect your guitar and a microphone and you can still get the ideas down and it's just i think now you know with technology everything's smaller and more convenient but it's still the same method of recording you know trying to capture it i think yeah one of the songs that i i've really enjoyed of yours one of my favorite songs of yours is inside out and that's got a pretty strong john mayer influence yeah yeah and yeah you also do a um cover of slow dancing in a burning room from John Mayer. Yeah. What is it about his music that really resonates with you? I think it's just it's the mood of it. I I like with music it's all about you know the music that I like is the music that moves me. And I think that's the really powerful thing with music whether it's blues, rock, soul, pop, rock, whatever it is. If you connect with it in some way, then it's it's good. you know and you 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 can play the same song to 10 people and they're all going to respond differently and with John Mayer's stuff um the certain songs like that one slow dancing i just really like the mood of it i like the 
think the lyric goes really well with um, the music. It's, it's very well recorded, but I just think the actual, you know, his guitar playing and his vocal on it, it's just, it's a really good song. It's got a good sentiment to it. And I guess that, you know, I just connected with that. And um, so I, yeah, sort of maybe took a couple of songs from that album, that Continuum album, as like, I was quite into that at the time. And that obviously ended up in me writing and recording Inside Out, which is clearly influenced by John Mayer. But me still trying to do my thing with it as well. So, right. But I think it's just that thing of, you know, as an artist, I mean, I, you know, I started out as a guitarist, then I started singing and writing. And I think in the early days, it was very much, you know, about the guitar. Like my early albums, they're very, you know, very guitar driven. And uh, I think I got more and more into the songwriting and um, thing. Probably, probably about 15 years ago, I started to sort of change direction a bit, maybe, and you know, go more the sort of song, more the song thing, where I'm, you know, trying to rather than trying to create something just as a vehicle for the guitar solo, I'm trying to create music to move people, I right. guess. In the same way that if I listen to something, I want to be, you know, I want to be moved by it. So, and it's a hard thing to do, but if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. <laughs> you had an album called The Tower Sessions, and on that album, yeah. there's a song, Purple Rain, that you covered. And you performed that here in Omaha. Yeah. What made you want to tackle such an iconic song like that? <laughs> well, that song, Purple Rain, I think we were at a live show and we were doing a sound check. And I think it may have been on the radio that day. And it's just, it's a really nice chord structure to play guitar over. If you're a guitarist, it's great, you know, to play over. And I was just noodling and then the guys joined in, the guys in the band at the time, different to my band now. Um, and we just started jamming it out in the sound check. It's like, hey, look, you know, that's Purple Rain, right? Let's, let's do it. Okay, looked up on, you know, Google, lyrics, Purple Rain, Prince. <laughs> <laughs> you know, wrote them out with a Sharpie. And um, I think we did it that night. We just jammed it. And the audience loved it. The next night, yeah, should we do that Purple Rain again? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. And it just, it just became a thing. And... Then we started getting people asking, you know, do you have an album with that on? No, 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 no we don't. Because it was just a live thing. Yeah. Oh, you've got to record it, you've got to record it. And then I thought, well, the only way we can record that song, if we do, if, if you know, so many people were asking for it. Um, and the version that we ended up with, which is kind of how it is now, it, you know, that kind of developed, where in the middle it comes down and I do the, you know, the noodly thing. Yeah. That kind of developed, and so, I th so if we're gonna if we're gonna record this, it's got to be live. It's got to be live, and that was the kind of the reason we did that that Tower Sessions album was mainly for that song, and then obviously we got you know the, all the other songs as well. So, <laughs> a little over a decade ago, you decided to start your own record label. Yeah. What prompted that decision? I think it was. The music industry is constantly changing. And I think at that point, like 2012, 2013, I'd been going for, you know, a good like 15 years. And I guess I'd kind of, because I'd been signed to labels, I'd kind of established myself as, a, as an artist or as a, you know, as a product or whatever, you know, the, 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 for the consumer. <laughs> you know, my name was kind of recognized enough that we decided, my wife, and, and me, we decided let's let's give this a go, you know. Let's set up our our own label and take it in house. Um, and uh, it was, I guess, like a leap of faith. Really, was it you, scary? Yeah, very. Yeah, because you don't you don't know how it's going to work, you know. But we'd seen other people do it, and it was actually my wife's idea. She, you know, she said, "Look, you know, let's why don't we set up our own label?" I'm like, "Nah, nah, nah." <laughs> no, 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 people do this and they, it fails, it doesn't work. And she's like, oh, well, we can try. I'm like, nah, no, no. <laughs> but she, she's pretty fearless with <laughs> this kind of stuff. And she was like, well, why can't we do it? I'm like, because it's very complicated, you've got to understand all this stuff. And she's like, well, I'll just, I'll just find out about it, I'll learn about it. 
She bought a book, a like, massive book, uh, you know, how to set up and run a record label independently. And she just read it wow. a few times. And she's like, right. And she just set the whole thing up. So it's, it's, it's Steph, really. My wife, Steph, she, she set it up. And I'm like, okay, fine. And, but the, the idea was if it didn't work and it all, like, fell on its ass, we could just go back, you know, I'd just look for another label to sign to. Yeah. Um, but it, it kind of worked. Well, I say it, it kind of worked. It really did work. Yeah. And so now we have everything in-house. We have our own label and she's my manager and it's very much between the two of us. Um, which is great because it means we're kind of in control of everything that goes on, you know. We, you know, we've got... We have a family, you know, kids and all that. So, it's, you know, I can tour when I want, how, for how long I want, you know, and all that sort of stuff. So it's, yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a good move. So thanks, Steph. <laughs> <laughs> is is that is that the best part of having your own label? Is is the freedom? I think so. Yeah, because also, creatively, I, I. I Writing songs and doing albums, I you know, I, I do, you know, you're obviously aware of other artists on the circuit. I see people churning stuff out, album after album after album. And I don't, I write when I, when I get the inspiration, when I get the, when I get the buzz. And I didn't want to be one of these artists where the labels write every 18 months, we want a new product. And you're right, you're putting stuff out just for the sake of it. So now I feel like I don't put stuff out you know, massively regular. You know, I'm not, you know, every sort of two or three years maybe I'll put something out, but it's when I've got something to say artistically. And I've, right. I've been doing this for a while now, so it's like, you know, I'm on definitely into double figures album-wise. So having it on our own label, it means, you know, I can just put stuff out when I'm ready, you know, because I, I just don't want to, like, saturate, you know, here's another realm, here's, here's another of uh, the same thing, here's some filler tracks because, you know, we had to put an album out but we didn't have enough songs. I'd, I'd, there's a few albums I did in previous times where it was kind of like, right, we need an album in three months. And it's like, okay. And you feel like under pressure to... I mean, the flip side of that is you can get a bit lazy with it, you know, and you're like, oh, I'll just do it whenever. So you still have to have that kind of discipline where you know, you're putting stuff out, you know, regular enough, you know. Yeah. What's the uh, worst thing about having your own label? The worst thing? Um, I don't know, really. I don't think there is. Uh, I don't really think there is any bad thing. I mean, I suppose the only bad thing is that, if there is a bad thing, is that you're having everything between you, it's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to do between the two of you. And like I say, we have a family as well. So, you know, when it's just two of you rather than a team or you can just say, right, go and sort that out. You don't have to worry about it. You know, it's basically me and Steph kind of running everything. So that, yeah, it can be a lot of, lot of work. Today, you know, a lot of artists are trying to give it a go, mm. you know, independently. Yeah. Do you have any advice for artists who are thinking about doing it on their own, having their own label? I think um, I think you you can do it now. I think it's just you've got to keep up with the industry, and it's constantly changing, constantly moving, like the whole social media thing. Because I, when I started my professional career, social media wasn't around, you know, and I've had to kind of like, oh, there's this new thing, you know, Instagram and Facebook and. YouTube and all that, and I'm like, okay, you have to you have to keep up with it, and I think you just got to keep current and make sure you've you've you're in the game with it, and understand it, understand all of the different mediums that you can use to, pro you know, promote yourself as an artist. I like to ask guitar players this when I have a chance to interview them because everyone has an opinion on it. What do you feel makes a great guitar player? Uh, <laughs> okay. <clears throat> What do I feel makes a great guitar player? Um, that's a tough one. Just try, just try and be yourself. Just try and... I mean, and it's really hard to, to come up with your own, own identity as a, as a guitarist or any musician because you're influenced by the people that made you want to play in the first place. But um, I, when I started out, Clapton was my first 
major influence. And then I got into Stevie Ray a bit later and, you know, Albert King, Albert Collins, B.B. King, all the blues players um, and some rock players. Like, I mean, really great guitar player, um, Jethro Tull, Martin Barr, and then Lindsey Buckingham from Fleetwood Mac. So a real mixture of guitarists. And I think every player is kind of, you're like your own collective of all that you're like, well, I like that bit from that guy and that bit from that guy. So you mix it all together. But I've never been a good impersonator of other people. So I've, I've tried to play like Clapton. I've tried to do, you know, the Albert King thing. I can't do it. So and I'd, whatever I do, I still just end up sounding like, like my, my version of it. And I used to not like that. Um, I, wanted, I wanted to sound like my heroes, but then I realized that nobody wants me to sound like Eric Clapton. People want me to sound like me. So, right. so I think what makes a great guitarist? That's yes. <laughs> I think just just coming up with your own thing, your own idea, and just trying to have your own identity and be, and be comfortable with that as well. You know, don't try and be someone else. Try and be yourself, yeah. If you could share the stage with any guitarist out there, who would you want to play with? I wouldn't mind walking on, onto a stage if, if Eric Clapton was there. Um, be kind of cool. It would be kind of cool. Yeah, yeah it'd be kind of cool. <laughs> um, or just any of my heroes, really. I mean, most of my guitar heroes, they're like the blues, blue, more bluesy players, but just feel players. I'm not, I've never been into like sort of flashy technical players. I'm, I'm into the guitarists that can almost do hardly anything and just like go, whoa, that was good. You know, it gets your attention. And I think as a guitarist, I'm not, I don't think I'm a flashy player. You know, I'm sort of a less is, less is more player, I guess. Um, you know, trying to just, yeah, tr try and move people with, you know, the minimum, you know, um, flash, really. Um, so, yeah, I don't, yeah, Eric Clapton. Um, who else? I don't know, BB King would have been cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, BB King definitely. That would have been cool for sure. What we know you as a blues rock guitarist. Yeah. But I mean, what what type of music do you listen to generally? Are you are you do you stay in the blues rock lane or do you go into different no, avenues as I, well? I don't really listen to blues rock or guitarists really. I uh, I like a uh, a lot of soul music, sort of like you know uh, Ray Charles. You know, I like sort of uh, Motown stuff. Um, I like some some pop stuff, uh, rock, you know, I like some sort of rockier stuff. Blue, I don't generally listen to that much blues these days. It's more, I'm, I guess, I listen to basically just, just good music. It's got good melody and just, yeah. And so it can be, like I say, it can be a, it can be a soul song from back in the day, or it can be a great vocalist, or but it's normally about the music, not not necessarily about the the player or the singer. It's normally about the music. It, it's, if it's a good song that's got a good melody that sucks you in, that's and it doesn't have to be a particular style. Um, I don't listen to that much blues rock stuff um, anywhere near as much as I used to. Yeah. It's been a couple of years now since you released your last album. Where are things with the next album? Well, we're, th we're, we're, we're planning to do a live thing. Uh, it's been a few years now since my last, I mean, my last live thing was Tower Sessions, and that was like a studio in session thing. Uh, the band now is a three piece, that has been for the last few years, and it started off initially as when we went back out on the road after, after the pandemic, we weren't sure how many people were going to come out. Uh, my keys player wasn't available. So I was like, look, guys, let's just go out, three of us, just the three of us. Let's just do the first tour like this and just, you know, see what happens in terms of how many people came out. Then, so we had to like re-engineer the set, some of the songs, we had to change them to like, you know, I'm filling in for the keyboard player, so I'm, I had to play differently. And then I think a couple of tours in, we were like, um, this is actually pretty cool and we've kind of embraced it and now it's very much, I think if we had a keyboard player, there'd be no space, you know, 
in in the bus or on stage or musically you know we've 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 kind of like re-engineered the entire thing so a lot of people over the last couple of years have said you know we really like the new three-piece thing you know um can we can we buy a product that's basically that can we have you got a live album with these guys and at the moment we don't have but that's the plan that's the plan and i'm, I'm writing for another original you know studio album probably next year Okay, so that live album, is that something we should expect soon? Yeah, I mean, we, we need to record it, yeah, but we're probably going to do that 98% uh, sure this year. We have uh, quite a long tour, a European tour, uh, October, November this year, so we're going to record some shows, and um, hopefully yeah, they'll be out next year. Fantastic. Well, Ainsley, it's been great having you on. Any final thoughts or anything else you want to get out there? Come and see the band. If, you know, if you haven't seen us, um, come and check us out. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, it's been great having you here in the U.S. Uh, yeah, I know it's, it's been great. It's been great fun. It's really, really cool to come over here. We don't get over here that often, so it's been an amazing week. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we'd really like to come over this way more often, and we we will try to in the future. All right, Ainsley Lister. That's going to wrap up this week's edition of the Blues Rock Show. For Ainsley Lister, I'm Pete Francis. We'll see you next time.